course, I'm, I'm delighted to, to be here tonight and, and, and be part of this uh, conversation. And I, I have to say, uh, uh, Daniel, that was a wonderful uh, discussion and a, and a, a very much needed uh, sort of sense of, of maintaining a, a critical distance on, on what is what we're told, what we're presented with in, in the media and coming out of the mouths of politicians and things like that. You mentioned uh, early on that, that experience of going into the, the bookstore uh, in Xinjiang where you'd been told that you know there were gonna be no children's books in, in Uyghur and then finding the shelves full of those that reminded me very much of uh, the first time that I traveled to Tibet, which was back in the 1990s, and uh, had been told many times that, of course, you know, it was illegal to, to, to possess a picture of the Dalai Lama, uh, and that you should never take uh, anything like that with you because you could get in all this kind of trouble. And when I arrived in Lhasa and went down to, uh, to the, the, the Jokong and the Barkor, the, the central uh, temple and the market around that, there were pictures of the Dalai Lama being sold in stalls uh, you know, right there on the street. And, and so this was just one of those moments of cognitive uh, dissonance. And it just, it just sounded very much like your experience in the bookstore. But um, yeah, I, I, what I would like to do just for, for a bit here is, is as, as Daniel just suggested, is step back a minute and think about um, what, what, what have been the realities, what have been the experiences of ethnic minorities in China and particularly in Xinjiang. Um, and, and so I want to I want to talk a little bit very briefly about kind of the, the larger historical background. This is what you get when you bring historians in, uh, but also about what what is the basic package of policies? What's the policy orientation of the government of the People's Republic towards uh, ethnic minorities? Uh, and, and how has that played out over the last 70 plus years of, of history? And then look more specifically at, at some of the, the particular issues out, out in Xinjiang itself. Um, the People's Republic of China, of course, uh, was founded in, in 1949. And uh, uh, in a sense, uh, you know, talking about international law and, and sort of the, the, the conventional ways in which political uh, uh, entities exist and interact in the world, it became um, the inheritor, if you will, of, of the previous uh, uh, state of play in, in, in China, which would have been the Republic of China, which itself, having come into being back in 1912, was the inheritor of the Qing dynasty, the last of the imperial dynasties. And it's very important to understand the Qing dynasty because that was a multi-ethnic state a state in which the, 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 the Han Chinese people were certainly the, the vast majority, but it was composed of many other ethnic groups. The ruling elite were non-Han people, the Manchus. They partnered with Mongols and Tibetans and Uyghurs and others um, and, and shared a, a, a large territorial space with uh, the, the Han Chinese and governed that in a way that, that took into account uh, the, the, the particular conditions of, of, of many, many different ethnic communities. Um, the course of, of 20th century history, the first half of the 20th century for China, of course, is very tumultuous and, and we don't need to try to go through all that. But when the People's Republic is established, they have to come to terms with that reality, with that space, that geographic space, the boundaries that had been established by the Qing dynasty, inherited by the Republic, and then became the boundaries of the People's Republic. And that included uh, areas in which non-Han uh, uh, ethnic communities were, were majority populations, including specifically Xinjiang in the, in the far western part uh, of China. Um, but there were also many other ethnic communities scattered throughout the geographic space of China. There are 56 recognized ethnic identities in China, one of which, the Han, are the vast majority. The other 55 constitute at this point in time about 7 or 8 percent of the overall population. So none of them very large in themselves, but, but in the aggregate, you know, a significant proportion of of the population, of the citizenry of the People's Republic. And, and you know, we get into some sort of linguistic confusion because of course we talk about China, we talk about the People's Republic, and, and sometimes there's a sense that, that when people talk about being Chinese, 
today in the People's Republic, that that's, that's still an ethnic identity. But to be Chinese today, to be a citizen of the People's Republic of China, doesn't designate a particular ethnicity. All the different ethnic communities are part of that political community. Okay, so that's one thing to, to bear in mind. But there's still the question, which was faced by the new government in the in the 1950s, of um, how how do you deal with these uh, with these di distinct uh, uh, ethnic communities, and the policy package that gets put together by the Chinese government um, operates on on kind of two tracks. And I want to take a minute to think about what those two tracks are and why why they're important. Why it's important to understand that there are these two. <coughs> Excuse me, because on the one hand. Um, there's a, there's a, 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 a commitment to respect and preserve the traditional identities, the traditional cultures, if you will, of these various ethnic communities. And, and here we should say that some of these communities, you know, are, 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 there are tens of millions of people, the Zhuang people down in southwestern China. There are perhaps 35 million people who can be identified as Zhuang. Uyghurs in Central Asia, in, in Xinjiang, are about 10 million. Tibetans, maybe five or six million. These are relatively large groups. Some of the ethnic communities are quite small, perhaps only, only a few tens of thousands of people. But in all of these instances, there's a, there's a, a policy commitment on the part of, of the, the new government, and this has been carried on down uh, throughout the last 70 plus years, to respect and preserve these, these traditional cultures, these traditional communities and senses of identity. And that means things like honoring language, uh, uh, you know, uh, preserving the spoken languages, or if they have them, written languages. Uh, of these of these communities, education to be carried on in the language spoken by the people of these different ethnicities in their in their communities, traditional customs, traditional music, traditional dress, uh, other kinds of, of cultural traditions, religion, honoring, respecting many many different religions. Not all the ethnic minorities in China uh, share a particular religion. Of course, Tibetans are Buddhist, Uyghurs are Muslim. Uh, so some of the communities in the Southwest or in, in various other parts of China are, are more traditionally animist. Some are not, you know, not particularly religious in, in one way or another. But whatever they may be, those religious traditions, those spiritual traditions are honored as well. And so there's that sense of, of trying to, to allow people to, to preserve and protect and keep intact these, these traditional cultural uh, uh, systems. But uh, there's another side, there's another dimension to all this that's, that's very important to understand. And that is uh, a sense of, or, or a desire for inclusion and opportunity. And, and what I mean by this is that the idea isn't to, to take a, a particular ethnic group uh, and say, like, for example, the, the, the Dai people who live down in Yunnan province in the southwest near the borders with, with Laos and, and Myanmar. The idea isn't to say, okay, we're going to take these people and we're going to put them in a little enclave. We're going we're gonna, to, you know, put them in a little preservation, you know, pod, and, and they're just going to stay the way they've always been. We're going to set them aside and we're just going to keep them as a kind of cultural curiosity. That's not what it's about. Uh, you know, you want to respect and preserve, honor their tradition. But inclusion and opportunity means China is a developing country. China is a country undergoing tremendous change, tremendous economic change. Uh, the material conditions of life have changed in, in amazing ways since liberation in 1949. Life expectancy uh, has grown. Infant mortality has dropped. Opportunities for education, opportunities in employment, you know, many, many, many different ways in which China has been a rapidly developing society. We all know, we all hear, you know, even, even with the anti-China propaganda, uh, we hear so much about, you know, economic development, economic growth in China. Uh, uh, and of course, anyone with any direct experience of China at all, if you've seen life in the cities, the towns, the villages of China, you know that there's been tremendous, tremendous change uh, in the course of the history of the PRC. The policies of, of preserving tradition should not mean and have not meant that, that ethnic minority peoples are excluded 
from that development, from that progress, from that change. Instead, in combination with the desire to preserve and protect the, these distinctive identities is a desire to create opportunities for people from these communities to be a part of the overall growth of China. And this is the kind of thing that we see especially uh, you know, being, being sort of twisted uh, when, we, when, we, when we look at, at a situation such as Xinjiang. Now, this gets all of these ideals, all of these goals get implemented in very practical ways. Um, it was mentioned, Daniel mentioned, that, that Xinjiang is what's called an autonomous region. Under the Constitution of the People's Republic, uh, geographic areas, administrative territories, within which a particular ethnic community constitutes a majority or a very significant proportion of the population, can be designated as autonomous regions, which is a province level unit, like sort of the equivalent of a state in the United States, or prefectures or counties or townships even, all the way up and down the administrative hierarchy, there are autonomous uh, entities. And indeed, Xinjiang itself, we hear a lot about, about the Uyghurs. We hear about the Uyghurs, which are the largest of the ethnic communities in Xinjiang, but by no means the only one. There are Tajiks and, and uh, 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 Kazakhs, Kyrgyz, a number of other uh, 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 generally Muslim uh, uh, communities, Islamic communities. The Tajiks, though, for example, speak Iranian-type languages, whereas the Uyghurs and others speak Turkic languages. So there's, there's a range of variety there as well. So each of these areas, each of these autonomous areas, um, has special administrative uh, policies and practices. And that has often meant uh, that, uh, that the, the ethnic minority communities uh, have been exempt from some policies that were applied elsewhere in China. Uh, uh, for example, in Tibet back in the 1950s, while land reform was being carried on throughout the rest of China, Tibet was exempted from land reform. Uh, the ethnic, all of the ethnic minority communities were exempted, for example, from the one-child policies while those were in effect, which meant as a very practical demonstration that those, the, the aggregate percentage of ethnic minority communities within China went from five or six percent up to now seven or eight percent. Uh, so because the Han population was, was being, you know, uh, kept in check, the proportion of non-Han peoples increased, okay? Uh, which also, of course, uh, uh, you know, sort of problematizes the idea that some sort of genocidal policies are being practiced against ethnic minorities. Um, the ethnic minority communities also have been uh, uh, the, 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 the targets, I suppose you could say, uh, of what we might think of what, what here in, in the United States we would call affirmative action programs, um, educational opportunities, uh, vocational training opportunities, different kinds of ways in which um, members, you know, people, young people, especially from ethnic minority groupings, uh, could be given special consideration to be brought into uh, more mainstream positions in terms of education, in terms of, of job opportunities and things like that. Now, that, when we look at the particularities of Xinjiang, uh, you know, that gets into some of these charges that are made. We hear, you know, uh, Daniel did a good job of, of, of talking about, uh, so, you know, so kind of the absurdity of these claims of, of genocide. And I just want to say that, of course, the, the term genocide is such an emotionally loaded term. And, and for Americans, you know, for ordinary Americans, we hear the term genocide. And with all the associations with, of course, the Holocaust in World War II, uh, you know, the, 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 the emotional appeal of that term is very powerful. And, and the propagandists who utilize it, who deploy it, they understand that. They understand that that's going to appeal to, to the better nature of Americans. Of course, we have a sympathetic response. We're like, oh my gosh, genocide. How terrible. But, you know, when we look at the realities, we see that, that, that they're not substantiated. And, and uh, uh, you know, this is, this, it's, it's, it's just that. It's a propagandistic effort at, at moralistic uh, sort of manipulation. Um, which is not to say that the relationship between the government of the People's Republic of China 
and the ethnic communities, especially in Xinjiang, is entirely frictionless, is entirely, uh, you know, we don't want to portray it as a, as a great big group hug love fest. Uh, certainly there are going to be uh, differences of opinion, there are going to be, uh, uh, you know, uh, problems sometimes in, in policy implementation and things like that. But to suggest that these things rise to the level of of something that could in any way be characterized as genocide just goes against all, not only the, the formal policies, but all the practical experience that we can actually document uh, uh, in, in China's relationship with, with its minority cultures. And this is reflected uh, in the attitudes that people have in Xinjiang. Uh, e even, we're not talking here about, you know, what does the Chinese government tell us about the attitudes of people in Xinjiang, but even Western uh, 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 public opinion surveys, uh, studies like the Ash Foundation, a Harvard study of public opinion in China, which includes areas, you know, includes Xinjiang, includes Tibet, includes these areas that, that are sometimes uh, 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 problematized in, in Western accounts, uh, where, where there's clearly overwhelming support for the central government, for the policies of that government, for the opportunities, uh, for the inclusion that is, uh, that is being carried out. I want to I want to talk just a little bit about some specific um, issues, some specific uh, 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 policies, some things things that 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 get talked about or get portrayed about about Xinjiang. Um, of course, you know we've all heard the stories that that a million, at least a million, maybe millions of Uyghurs have been rounded up and placed in detention camps. Uh, well, this is, this is clearly not true. This is one of those things that uh, uh, the Australians, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, likes to put out uh, satellite photos of, of buildings in Xinjiang and claim that these are detention camps when they're actually investigated, when you go and look at them, when, when outside independent observers have verified these. They've been government offices or schools or apartment complexes. You know, it, it's a very problematic thing. But in general, that idea has been, uh, has been pretty thoroughly debunked. But there are actually programs run by the government in Xinjiang through which a number of people, in, in some instances, very large numbers of people have, uh, have passed, okay? But there are basically two kinds of programs and it's important that we understand this and that we separate one from the other. There are, there have been in Xinjiang uh, political elements that um, wish to separate the province, sever separate the region from the rest of China, and to create there uh, a, an Islamic state. Uh, there was briefly, back in the 1930s, something called the East Turkestan Republic, uh, which was an Islamic fundamentalist uh, state, which, of course, banned education for women and their appearance in public uh, without uh, veils and things like that, which you know, wanted to enforce the, the Sharia law, uh, things like that. And there are elements in Xinjiang uh, uh, that, uh, that wish to revive that or create some other new kind of, of Islamic state uh, there. And those elements uh, have uh, uh, on occasion engaged in terrorist activities, bombings, attacks on police stations, seizure of weapons, not just in Xinjiang, but elsewhere, even in the capital, in Beijing. Uh, buses have been blown up uh, in other parts of the country, uh, attacks on, on travelers at train stations, things like this. Um, so there have been real security concerns. One of the, the programmatic responses to that has been efforts to, as, as, it's, as it's put, de-radicalize, uh, uh, especially younger people, in Xinjiang, younger people from the various Islamic ethnic uh, communities, not just Uyghurs, but, but others as well. Um, that's a relatively small program uh, in terms of the overall numbers of, of people, uh, 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 you know, maybe tens of thousands of people going through that, or maybe as much as 100,000 people going through that, nowhere near the same scale. And of course, that's stretched out over long uh, periods of time. But such programs exist in which people are uh, you know, uh, there's, there's political education, there's talk about, you know, why this kind of, of, of violence, why this kind of radicalism is not, uh, is not good, is not, is not defensible, is not supportable. Um, so those, those programs do exist. 
Uh, and, and of course, programs like that exist in, in Western countries as well. This is, is you know, this is a, a, this kind of, of terrorist violence is not something that, that a government that cares for the safety and security of its people is going to, you know, really be e eager to tolerate. But the much larger programs in Xinjiang have been, um, as the Chinese government says, these are vocational programs. Uh, this gets dismissed, of course, as just propaganda claims in, in the Western media for the most part, but even the New York Times had to admit in an article about a year ago that 485,000 people who had passed through these programs were at that point employed uh, in various uh, occupations, and not we're not talking about uh, you know picking cotton in in the fields, although some people obviously do that. Uh, but but in places like uh, like the Volkswagen factory outside of Urumqi, uh, Volkswagen of course has has issued public reports about its employment its effort to include people from the Uyghur population in its employment pool and its recruitment pool. Um, this is part of the, the, the side of the ethnic policies of inclusion and opportunity. So for people to go through these, uh, let's say that a million Uyghurs have gone through vocational training programs. This isn't a matter of rounding people up and putting them into a camp behind barbed wire, but it is a matter of people going through government sponsored programs where they perhaps live in dormitories and take classes and then they go out and, you know, maybe half a million of them have gotten jobs and are working uh, and this was a year ago, I imagine the numbers are, are, are greater than that now, uh, working in gainful employment in, in the modernizing sectors of the economy. This is the kind of opportunity and inclusion that is a, a goal of government policy. Uh, starkly in contrast, one might say, with the marginalization and, and, uh, and, and discrimination uh, of a system such as we have in the United States where Native Americans are basically confined to reservations where economic conditions and public health are, are pretty minimal. Uh, trying to bring people from the ethnic communities into the mainstream uh, it seems to me to be a much more positive and, and creative way to, to deal with all this. Uh, of course, uh, uh, Daniel, as I say uh, uh, earlier, talked a lot about, uh, about the, the genocide claims and, and uh, talked about, for example, the, the, the lack of refugees, the hand-picked uh, spokespeople who legally exited China without having to, uh, you know, uh, you know, somehow escape in, in some great traumatic way. Uh, their accounts, uh, uh, you know, funded by, supported by things like the National Education for, uh, or Endowment for Democracy and other semi-clandestine American government operations. Those stories notwithstanding, there's simply very, very little, really no indication uh, substantively of anything that could by any means uh, be defined as genocide by any, any normal rational application of that term. Uh, Daniel also mentioned uh, this question of the birth rate, the idea that, that uh, the decline, and, and it is a documented statistical decline in the birth rate amongst uh, minority women. Um, the idea seems to be uh, on the part of people who hold this up as, as a, a claim of, of genocide that, that uh, minority women uh, couldn't possibly be making a choice to, to, to reduce uh, their, their, uh, their childbearing. Uh, this is, that kind of reduction is a standard feature. Uh, it's called, dem demographers call it the demographic transition that we see in modernizing societies from Europe in the 19th century on down around the world to the present day. Uh, and of course, China itself in the recent, uh, uh, the new statistics that are coming out from the more recent census, uh, the birth rate in China itself has dramatically dropped. There's, there's some people expressing concern that, uh, that uh, the Chinese population itself is going to start shrinking. So, you know, to, to, to sort of portray this, to take this uh, idea that there's been a drop in the birth rate amongst uh, Uyghur, young Uyghur women uh, as, a, as an indication of some sort of coerced policy on the part of the government goes against what is the, the much more reasonable and rational and, and, and self-evident explanation that it's simply a response to better opportunities, better economic conditions, better education, and better agency, enhanced agency for Uyghur women as they become part of, of a modernizing overall society. So I think that when we look at, at China's policies and we look at China's practices, we see uh, you know, a reality, we see uh, uh, both a, a commitment 
uh, and, a, and, a, and, and a lot of follow through on that commitment to both preserve and protect community identities and at the same time to provide opportunities for people from minority communities to be part of China's overall growth. It is of course that overall growth, the flourishing, the increasing prosperity of China, China's emergence once again in the world as a significant economic force that is perceived by some in the United States, by the established power elites in the United States as a threat. But their choice to try to demonize China, to try to characterize China's policies towards you know, a, a, a significant minority of its populations as, as genocidal, as, as oppressive, this simply doesn't coincide with the, the realities both of, of, of political commitment and policy by the government and of the experience of people uh, on the ground uh, living their lives, their improving lives uh, in China today. So I'll let it go at that and uh, turn it back to you, Sheila.